speaker. Yeah, so it's an honor to finish off the conference. Uh, hopefully you were able to stay awake. Uh, it's been a long day and uh, I have a lot of information I'm going to throw at you. So uh, let's get through this. Uh, so yeah, my talk is about uh, doing software updates on embedded Linux. Uh, so a quick uh, session overview. Uh, I will do a quick intro uh, on myself. Uh, and then we're going to go through some uh, basic uh, concepts of doing software updates on embedded Linux. Uh, and then we're going to try to take a look at the uh, open source uh, ecosystem around software updates, uh, the existing projects that exist uh, out there. And we'll focus on uh, which strategy, strategy they employ, uh, which, key, which are the key features of each project, and also take a look uh, how active the community is or how big the community is around this project. So quickly about me, uh, FOSS enthusiast of course I'm here uh, speaking. I uh, work mostly with uh, board support package development so I do a lot of Linux kernel stuff, even bootloaders. Uh, uh, the last few years it's been a lot of the Yocto and the way core work. Uh, and I'm employed by Endian Technologies which is a local uh, contractor company uh, and I, I would also like to add a disclaimer uh, I am a more of a mentor is a project that I'm going to cover uh, which I'm involved in uh, uh, in the community so I, but I would try not to be biased when comparing it to the other ones so but you, you, know, you know that so embedded Linux devices uh, question is yeah what's an embedded Linux device uh, well, nowadays Linux is in everything, so in public transport, in trash cans and faucets or, or for some reason. So Linux is everywhere, so it's pretty generic what an embedded Linux device is. Uh, but they all run, run software and they all need uh, to update software, of course. Uh, and there are some key factors uh, on the, uh, the embedded Linux environment uh, has some uh, differences compared to like uh, desktop uh, PC uh, Linux or server-side. So nowadays we, we have a lot of connected devices so usually you have you don't, yeah you have no physical access to your devices or it's very hard to get to your devices or it's very costly to get ex physic physical access to your device uh, so that's a limitation uh, that you have to like consider when deploying embedded Linux devices. And normally the long lifespan is pretty long in embedded Linux uh, compared to uh, other products. Uh, so, and it's getting even longer as like embedded Linux is deployed in cars. And cars live more than five to ten years, hopefully. Uh, so, that's one of one of the considerations you have to you know, like uh, keep in mind. And uh, a common thing is like also unreliable, unreliable power supply, uh, something that. If you have a device installed in a public transport, like in a bus, uh, you can lose power at any time. So you have to take, keep that in mind when doing, uh, for example, software updates. It plays a big role uh, to handle this uh, situation. And often if, it's, if, if the device is connected in somehow, uh, they're usually connected with mobile, or so you have unreliable uh, connectivity, uh, which you also have to, yeah. It's a limitation that you have to, that you have to handle in your embedded device. Uh, so why do we need software updates? Well, these are hopefully pretty obvious, but uh, just quickly. So we need to fix issues. We don't write perfect software. So once we deploy our devices, we need to, to be able to update the software in the devices, either locally or remotely. Uh, we want to be able to add features. So once you uh, deploy your device, uh, and this is quite critical nowadays where time to market is often a thing and the devices are rushed so then you can ship your device with some critical features and add more features later on with uh, software updates and of course security updates uh, is one of the biggest reasons why we need to do, keep doing uh, updates when the devices are in the wild because like most of us know uh, as software gets older, it gets more and more known exploits and vulnerabilities, of course. So there's even a fancy data, data database that you can go and look up known exploits on components that are critical in embedded Linux devices. 
So here I have an example for uh, Dropbear as a SAID server. And this is like, yeah, anybody, can, anybody can look this information up and uh, exploit that if you haven't updated that, that component, so to say. So we need to continuously update our devices to close the security holes that are exposed. So one use case when doing software updates is uh, doing it on site. And that means that you have physical access and the device doesn't have uh, internet connectivity. So you have to have a technician or the other user, and this usually involves like a USB flash drive uh, with some kind of image that you need to like plug into the device so it can update. So this is a fairly u easy use case, but nowadays it's more focused on like doing over the air updates because devices are getting connected and then we can utilize the connectivity uh, to do software updates, uh, not requiring a technician or a user going to the device with a USB flash stick. Uh, and this opens opportunities, but also uh, there come some challenges with this, of course. Uh, it's not an easy thing to implement uh, in a robust way. But when you do software updates over there, you, you usually need some kind of deployment serve management server where you can manage your devices and uh, deploy the software updates to the device. So, uh, uh, typical components uh, of an embedded Linux device, uh, a bit simplified, but this is generally what I see when I look at the embedded Linux devices. You, you normally have some kind of bootloader. Uh, most cases it's U-boot. Uh, then you have some kind of, you have the Linux kernel. Uh, and as I work mostly with ARM devices, you need to have a device tree that goes to the Linux kernel. Uh, and then you have your root file system, uh, the distribution part. And with this, mean, uh, with this I mean like your init manager, your network manager, and all the software that you don't actually write. You just rely on this functionality to be there in your Linux distribution. And then you have some kind of custom up uh, application on top of that. Uh, in some cases, you also have some kind of uh, MCU uh, or microcontroller on the side of the Linux that also needs software updates. But I'm not really going to cover that, but it's still there. Uh, so some basic requirements that you need when you do software updates. Uh, uh, we have some requirements, of course. Uh, so you need, you need to be able to update all the co components uh, that you have. So you need to update, be able to update the Linux kernel because Linux kernel also has vulnerabilities over time uh, that are exposed. Uh, or you need new features enabled in the Linux kernel. The same with the device tree. Uh, so you need to be able to update each. And normally, you don't update the bootloader because that's a single point of failure and you don't really, there's no way to build in uh, redundancy in that. So if that fails, your device becomes a brick. Uh, and that's the second most, like uh, a software update it shall not be able to brick the device ever. No matter what happens, if there's a power loss or if there's well, whatever you do to the device, like during a software update, it should never render the device useless because I removed the power to it, so to say. So that needs to be taken care of, of course. Uh, atomic updates, that means when you do a software update, it can't be 50% successful. So it has to either be fully installed or nothing. Uh, because even if you, if you have an update system that isn't atomic, you can update 50% of the system and it's still bootable, but then you int introduce weirdness because you, you don't really know what's updated. What's, so it has to be atomic. Uh, rollback, so, so that's a, like if, up, if you're middle in an update uh, and you remove the power, it should revert back to, to the working software that was there before. That's not, not always possible, so we're going to get into that a bit more later. Uh, and you need some basically basic integ integrity checks, like checksums on your update images, so they are not corrupted when you are transferred them to the device. Uh, you need some kind of a sign, signing mechanism of your update images to disallow like third parties to like come with a USB flash drive with some random image and just run it on your device. So usually you sign these kind of images, so it's so they are from a trusted source, and you only run that if it's signed, so to say. 
And there needs to be some kind of compatibility check in your update system. Uh, so if you have multiple devices, uh, um, the update image should contain like this image is for this device. So, you, so, you're, not, so you're, you're not able to like cross install two images to two different devices and uh, like uh, and break them. Okay. Uh, yeah. So and some basic requirements for like when you go uh, over the air as well. So you need to have a secure communication channel uh, because you know, over the air means you have a client running on the device and you have a server in the cloud uh, which deploys the updates. Uh, so you need to have a secure channel to communicate so no one can eavesdrop. Uh, and you also need to have trust in your system. So device, device authentication is important. So that the device trusts the server and the other way around. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a one liner here, but it's quite complex. If you, if you, I could have a talk just about the device authentication, but it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, so some common approaches that exist in uh, the embedded, embedded Linux world. Uh, so normally, historically, image-based or block-based updates have been the most common uh, strategy to use in embedded Linux. Uh, and mostly because it's easy to implement, it's easy to test, it's easy to verify and maintain. And the simplicity is really key when doing this. Uh, but I'll cover this more in detail. Uh, then there's another approach where we have still image-based updates, but atomically uh, incremental. Uh, so that's also common referred to as delta updates. So you only, uh, yeah, we'll get into that a bit more later. Uh, and there's some uh, there's some projects that do that do software updates uh, through container technology, but that means that you need to run containers on your embedded Linux device, and then you automatically inherit some of the functionality of containers and updates and stuff like that. But there's a project that I will cover that uh, does this and we'll get into that a bit more. Uh, then there, there's the standard uh, desktop package managers, which that question often arises, like why can't we use package managers? Uh, and the biggest problem is, well, primarily they're not designed for the embedded use case and the, the embedded environment. So, there, in, there are situations where they, are, they can work, uh, but still, the biggest problem is it's not atomic. Uh, so normally when you go do an up get update, uh, you get a hierarchy of uh, like uh, updates, and if you get a power loss in one of these steps, you will have a, like a partially updated system. So it's not it's not atomic, and that's why most people avoid it uh, in embedded Linux devices. And there's some complex complexity to handle packages as well uh, in testing and um, to manage a package feed for your embedded Linux device. So image-based updates. So what's an image? Uh, so this is an image. Uh, so what you do, basically, you bundle everything that you have on your embedded Linux device beside the bootloader, because you don't really update the bootloader. Uh, so we have our root file system, and we make sure that our Linux kernel and the device tree is inside the root file system, normally under slash boot. Uh, and then you have your distribution components, then you have an application, or if you, and you have an update client, uh, and you have a microcontroller firmware, maybe if you have an external microcontroller that you need to update. And this is the image. Uh, so when you create an update image, it contains everything always. So if you are updating just the apps, you still write the whole thing. So you always have a, a single working image uh, that you flush on your device. And this is the most, yeah, last 15, 20 years. This is what's been used basically in embedded Linux devices. Uh, so there are two kind of strategies that, that are normally deployed uh, when using image-based updates or like how you structure your system. Uh, so normally you have a bootloader uh, and you have some kind of recovery operating system. And this is normally an uh, init RDS system or init RAM disk. Uh, and then you have your main OS uh, where your, the Linux kernel and all the components that I have in my previous slide, uh, where they are. 
This is how Android has been doing like the operating system updates forever. Uh, so if you think Android, you get a notification, there's an update, you want to reboot and install, you press yes and it reboots. So that's what happens, it goes to the recovery OS uh, and then you have like wait for 20 minutes for it to install. And this is really, it has built-in safety, so even if that update fails, you always have the possibility to go back to the recovery OS and try again. Because normally you store the update image in a, in a persistent shared area uh, between the recovery OS and the main OS. The biggest downside with this approach is downtime, because while you are flashing your update, the device is unusable. And historically, like Android, it takes forever to update it. So while it's updating, you can't do anything. Uh, and this next approach to image-based updates is you remove the recovery OS and instead have two operating system components that are identical to each other. Uh, and you always have an active uh, operating system and you have an inactive operating system. Uh, and this is what Android is moving towards uh, on new devices deployed with Nougat, uh, the latest uh, Android version. Uh, so they have also moved to this strategy. And Android markets this as, as seamless updates because one of the benefits of this is that you can update the secondary operating system while the device is running. Uh, so you don't really have a downtime besides you need to reboot to switch. Uh, so once you have updated uh, main USB, uh, you reboot and tell, U-boot, uh, tell the bootloader, now I want to change US to the secondary one, and the other one becomes inactive, and you keep doing that, switching every time you update. And this is also has like built-in safety and built-in rollback. So if the fail update doesn't, the updated image doesn't boot, it can all easily fall back to the previous working one. But the biggest, the biggest downside, of course, with this is that you need to have two copies of the operating system, uh, which kind of is not a big problem nowadays because flash storage is cheaper. So at least the devices that I work with usually have gigabytes like of storage. So it's not really a problem nowadays, but it was before when flash like storage was expensive. So the open source uh, ecosystem around uh, software update has gotten quite big over the past five, six years. So there's so many projects that you can hardly fit them in one slide uh, that, that solve a lot of the complex complexity of this. So you don't have to like uh, reinvent the wheel every time you do a new product because there are ex existing pr uh, projects. So I've split up the projects in uh, two, two main areas because they have a lot of like, they have the different focus. So there are the projects that are so-called frameworks, uh, which is, they actually enable, they're, they're, they're a set of tools that enable you to design your update system. So they are not like, they're not aiming to be an out of the box solution. So these projects are like just giving you the tools, doing the, some of the low level stuff to design an update system, so to say. So the first project and the oldest one uh, that's been around since 2010, well, uh, is Software Update, <laughs> generic name. Uh, so it came out of uh, Denks, uh, the German contractor company, uh, which is also behind U-Boot. Um, uh, and Stefano Babic, who works there, is the creator and maintainer of this. Um, so basically what it is, it's a update agent uh, that's written in C, so and it slices under GPL v2. Um, and it also integrates like tooling to create an update image uh, that you want. Uh, this project focuses on uh, the symmetric and asymmetric image based updates only. Uh, and in some cases it can actually do like single file updates or single, so you can really, it's like Flexibility is one of the aims of this project, so because it is a frame framework more than a out-of-the-box solution. Uh, and one of the cool features of this is it has an integrated web server uh, in the update agent. So if you deploy this on the device, you have a web server uh, already there 
to upload new updates, so to say. So you just, like, uh, through the web browser, you can upload images, which removes the need for the flash drive, uh, which is a nice, nice feature. And, uh, most of, and, and of course, it's, it supports, like, cryptographic signing and verification of updates. Uh, and it works on all the file systems. Uh, it has a unisocket interface to get to read out some status information, so, like, progress bar of an update, uh, you can read that through a uh, Unix API. Uh, and all these projects need to integrate with bootloaders, so, and software update integrates well with U-Boot, Grub, EFI. Uh, and for integration, most of these projects, and even software update, focuses on Yocto, so there's Yocto layers to get started uh, quickly, so to say. And it's also build root support. Uh, it also it's extensible with over-the-air updates because it doesn't have a built-in over-the-air update technology. So it's just on the device. But it's extensible to talk with something that's called a Hawkbit. I will cover that a bit later. But it's, Hawkbit is an open source server component for over-the-air updates. So the community is pretty big around software update because it's been around for quite a while. Uh, and they've done so far 18 releases, and they do like a four-month cycle release. So every four months they do a new release. Uh, has a lot of contrib contributors, very active mailing list, and they take all contributions to to the mailing list. So pull requests on GitHub is not accepted. So they take patches the old way. Uh, there's also reference boards to get to started quickly, like Raspberry Pi, Big and Black. Uh, so it's really easy to try out. And the next project, very similar, uh, but from Pengatronics from Germany. So there's like some competition going on here. Uh, but it's uh, also a C client uh, update agent, and there's also host tooling to create the update artifacts. Focuses also, initially it focused on symmetric and asymmetric image-based updates only. Uh, and one of the main goals with RAUC is to integrate well with applications. So they expose a Daybus API, for example. Uh, so you can control the update process from an application via Dbus and uh, retrieve update status as well. Uh, there's an experimental features to do uh, Delta updates as well with Chaosync, uh, but it's still marked as uh, experimental. And as I said, Dbus interface, it works with all the common storage mediums found in embedded uh, Linux devices. It works well with uh, the most common bootloaders uh, that exist. Also has a Yocto layer for integration. And also connects to, is able to, co to connect to Hawkbit for over there updates. But they provide a Python library uh, for that. Yeah. And something that they have done really well is they have a solid test infrastructure on their update agent. So there's a lot of unit tests. They have around 70% code coverage, which is always nice uh, that they are testing. Uh, but it's fairly, it's not been around as much as a software update. So they have only done six releases, and it's still not 1.0. So that tells us something, maybe. It's not really. Uh, but they do take contributions and uh, like issue handling is uh, managed on GitHub. Uh, but what are the, I, I couldn't really farm, find any reference boards. To, uh, so I've not, never really tried this one because I, I can't find any reference implementations of integration, the integration work. So quickly just hawk a bit. I'm, I'm not that, but this is a Eclipse Foundation project. So it's a standalone server component to manage uh, like over there updates for uh, IoT. Uh, and this is what the, like the software update and RAUC uh, integrate with. So they're like, they're standalone components, and, but this exposes an API that uh, they can utilize. Uh, it's fairly, it's based on Java and the Java Spring Boot. So these are technologies that I'm not very familiar with. So it's I've never really tried to set this up myself because it looks complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. Yeah. So 
the next project, uh, we are still under framework projects that are not like end-to-end sort of -end solutions. So libOSTRI, uh, often described like uh, Git for op operating system binaries. Uh, and the reason behind the description, it's, it's the tooling around the libOSTRI is very Git-like. So you do Git pulls and Git uh, stuff like that, or OSTRI pulls. Um, but the, the, the way it does uh, Delta updates is also very, it has an, uh, like a repository and an object store, and uh, so it's very trying to mimic Git, but for like operating systems. Uh, it's C and LGPL. And the main feature for LibUSRI, it does only binary deltas on uh, image, images, so to say. But this comes with some complexity, so it's, complex, uh, but yeah, it has to be. So just quickly what, is, what, what the structure is to like, you know, to get insight in uh, what it is. So normally you, what we have is like slash OS3 repo. So you have a repository of the file system on your device, uh, and you also have that repository some, somewhere on the server. Uh, then you have some kind of structure where you have deploy, and then you have different deployments. Uh, and what they actually do is like slash user uh, is the only directory that Westry manages. So everything has to be a slash user if you want to be able to update it. But slash user is only hard links to the Westry repository. Uh, so it kind of deviates a bit from the like standard Linux uh, uh, structure that you're familiar with. So you have to adopt, adopt your system to this uh, quite a bit. And you normally you need to boot to an uh, initram fs to change route to the de uh, deployments. And then also slash var is like where you store the persistent state. So if you want to keep things between updates, that's where you store it. Because yeah, the OS3 doesn't do anything with that directory. Um, it has some problems, uh, according to me. <laughs> it, it, it came. It's. It's targeted for a PC running Linux. Uh, and it came out of a project called GNOME Continuous. Um, so it didn't really, like, uh, the embedded use case wasn't there from the beginning. Uh, but people have adopted it for embedded because Delta updates is really good if you have, like, a limited bandwidth, bandwidth on your mobile network, for example. But there's also Yocto integration. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a meta updater layer. Uh, and the re reference views, you can try it out quite quickly on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so these are some of the projects that I've ad adopted LibOSTRI. Lib so it's mostly like, you like, know, continuous is where it started. Uh, and you have Flatpak, which is a package manager for desktop. And you have something called Project Atomic, which is also um, a desktop server uh, project. Uh, QTOTA uh, is based on LibOS3 as well. Uh, and then you have a, uh, a component called uh, Actualizer, uh, which is part of Geneva, Geneva SOTA. Uh, I will cover that project a bit more later on. Just quickly, there's another project called Software Update, but <laughs> removing a generic name again. Uh, very similar to LibOSTRI, they also focus only on Delta-based updates. Uh, it comes out of uh, an Intel Linux distribution called Clear Linux, uh, where they use this project. Uh, but also, it seems that that's the only place where it's used. So I haven't seen any like any big community or that uh, a lot of people are, are adopting it. Uh, but there's also a Yocto layer, which is actually inactive. Uh, uh, hasn't had many updates in a while, but I just want to mention it. <coughs> so now we're going to move to the end-to-end -end solutions. So these are projects that focus on the whole chain, like especially for over-the-air updates. So the first project is uh, Mender, uh, which is an end-to-end -end open source solution for software updates on embedded Linux devices. Uh, and the key thing here is that they have a 
client that runs on your device and the, the, the server component uh, where you can manage your deployments is open source as well. So you have the whole chain, so to say. Uh, I'm going to wait for you to take pictures. <laughs> uh, so some insights in how Mender works. So Mender deploys a symmetric AB update uh, strategy. So that means that you have two copies of your uh, main operating system. But as I said, they, the whole chain is open source. You have a management server where you connect your devices and where you can manage uh, deployments and uh, send them out, so to say. Yeah. And some of the key things is uh, the, the updates are streamed from the server to the device. So they're never uh, intermediately stored. Uh, that's one of the benefits you have with two operating system. Uh, you can just stream the update to the inactive part. So you don't have to store it locally. And they, of course, also support uh, signing of the update images and stuff like that. That are quite basic things that, that need to be supported. Uh, so Yocto integration, again, most of these projects focus on like integrating well with Yocto. Uh, there's a meta Mender layer. They also focus a lot uh, on uh, test coverage. So they have uh, quite a large suite and, uh, of unit tests on uh, the client that runs on the device. But they also have, uh, and it's open source as well, uh, integration tests on QMU, Raspberry Pi, Black Rip, uh, Peekabon Black. So they do like the full testing of the server and do like updates on each like uh, pull request, so to say. So they, they have put a lot, and that's open source as well, which is cool. And there's a quite active community, and I'm part of it as well. So. Uh, but they use like Jira, there's an open, uh, Open uh, Jira instance where you do where they manage uh, where you do bug reports and you can also go there and see like what they're working on currently and uh, join the discussions and stuff like that. And they've done ten releases if that says anything. Uh, there's a mailing list which is quite at active for us asking questions and stuff like that. Uh, contributions on GitHub, normal pull requests uh, flow. Uh, but the cool thing is also that they have like 30 repositories in, in their organization. So they have all the tooling, like I said, the integration tests, the unit tests, the, all, all, of this, all of this is open source. So that's why they have so many repositories. Uh, so the next project uh, is Resin.io. Uh, and this is, yeah, as you said, the title here. Uh, they utilize containers uh, or container technology, uh, which means that you need to run a container on your device and you need to run your application in a container. And then they can inherit the functionality of uh, Docker containers or other container technology uh, to get the Delta updates. So if you just update the application, uh, you can get like small update chunks instead of like, the full image update. But the problem, one of the problems with Resin is that the management server is still proprietary, so that it's not open source, even if the, they are hinting in their blog posts that they are planning on releasing it, but it's not, it has not happened yet. Uh, but they have open sourced the Resin, uh, the Resin OS, which is the operating system that you run on your device, with, uh, where you have the container technology, so to say. So you can build something uh, quite easily. So just a quick overview how, how, how it works. Um, they've actually written on their own uh, Docker-compatible uh, container client, uh, which is, they in initially used Docker, uh, but they realized that it wasn't really well suited for embedded devices. Uh, so that's pretty cool, and that's open source. So they have uh, created a container client for embedded devices specifically. And that's how they get like the Delta updates. Uh, <clears throat> but this means that your applications needs to run in a, a container, basically, or multiple applications. <clears throat> but they do symmetric AB updates for uh, this part still. So if you want to update the underlying operating system, they have a, they do similar to Mender, the dual operating system approach. So they have the possibility to update that as well. 
but they only support EMMC SD cards. So what I've seen, they don't support UBI, or which is used on uh, NAND flashes, for example. And ATS Garage uh, is a project uh, from Advanced Telematics, now a peer company, uh, apparently. So this is built on, on top of uh, LibOS3. So they, they have a client, written a client in C++, and uh, uh, that is able to communicate with the backend, uh, but still uses uh, LibOS3 underneath. Uh, so they have a ATS garage uh, uh, where you can log in for the server component, uh, which is preparatory, but they have a OTA community edition, so you can deploy the server yourself. Uh, but still, uh, I haven't seen any stable releases, and it's, it's not really there, the community edition. Uh, it seems it's not really there yet. Ooh, there's so many projects. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a quite new one to me. I, I haven't, I, like, when I was doing research for this talk, uh, I found this one. I have never heard of it before, uh, but it's good. More, more op op open source projects. So it's called Update Hub. Uh, I don't really know much about it. I just wanted to mention it uh, because it is there. Uh, it seems to be fairly, fairly new since December 2017 could be worth looking into more on what it offers. So, yeah, that's the projects I think. And uh, to summarize all this, there's quite a big uh, ecosystem. Uh, and these projects have been around for quite a while now as well. So there are proven solutions out there that simplify uh, integrating a, a proper, robust uh, update solution on your devices. Uh, so no reason to go homegrown, start hacking, uh, because there, there are open source, well-established open source pro projects that we can collaborate on. That was quicker than I thought. Uh, questions? <coughs> yeah? Uh, which of these software would you think would be best suited for a platform that actually doesn't have the right software? Uh, the most common approach, I guess, if, you, if you're not able to, to do, deploy a dual uh, AB, uh, the next step back is deploy the recovery OS. The, a smaller... Yeah, you have a smaller recovery operating system that you need to boot into to be able to flash. Uh, then you stay, save, you don't have to have a second. But you still have to have a intermediate storage because if you download it, update in the main operating system, you need to store it somewhere. But that storage can be a lot slower than your normal. Yeah, yeah, and smaller, maybe because you can comp compress the update images and stuff like that. So, uh, so that's the next step. But uh, yeah. So, which component do you have? Yes, yes. Which well, um, it's mostly software update and the RAUC. They have uh, this uh, approach because member, for example, is it's fixed. It's AB updates only, so they're not trying to. But no. yeah, I have a question. Uh, mm. When you have this uh, symmetric, like uh, like Mender has, so you have this OSA and OSB, and one of them is active, mm. and then you so like say you're running A and you downloaded a new version of B, mm. and then you want to switch to B in the bootloader. Yeah. So all that logic and. Let's say the new uh, you were switching to B, but it failed. So you want to go back to A. Mm -hmm. So all that logic is that then in U boot, or where where is where do you? Yeah, boot? it's where different for every bootloader. But yeah, bootloader has to have the logic to handle. Uh, U boot has this built in already called something boot counters. So yeah, it's simply a boot counter that you store in U boot environment. So every time you boot, it counts up once. So you can set a threshold if if it has booted ten times, do something else instead of like trying to. But what you normally do, if you are able to boot, you clear that counter. So U boot has built in uh, like a feature for this already. Uh, I'm not quite sure how how you would handle it in like Rub or uh, other bootloaders. So if I want to do like this, maybe you can go to the 
symmetric over subplane slide. It was mentioned about the you know the bootloader part. Yeah, that was so much slide. Yeah. 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 And if I want to do this over A to B update, but yeah. I want to skip the bootloader, let's say if I have a very old bootloader that pre device three days, mm -hmm. and I want to have a new kernel with device three and everything, mm -hmm. can I keep the same bootloader and update to the new kernel? And new yeah. You know, the only features that you need in the bootloader is, like just mentioned, the, the boot counter feature, so that you can set, uh, like, if this boot fails. So if, if you update main USB and it tries to boot it, uh, but it, like, it fails, and there needs to be some logic to revert back, that, and this is usually uh, handled in uh, the bootloader. The bootloader does, does it not need to have a device support or anything? No, if, if it's able to boot your device, Without this, uh, yeah, it should work. So it's just that feature that you need. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to add, um, uh, I built something quite similar to this, but we uh, we kernel executed a new kernel, so you could sideload it in runtime without needing a reboot. Uh, but sometimes it could fail, but then you could just do a full reboot, and if it failed, you would revert back to the old uh, OS. But okay. It's kind of the same, but you don't always have to reboot the entire operating system. When you do it, so it's a bit faster that way. Okay. okay, so you do that. So you do like a new kernel execute, and then you purge the old kernel. And do you do a new unit as well? Uh, yeah, you know, do the k yeah, 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 and you launch the new kernel on top. So your condition for uh, deciding that the update is okay is that we got it boots? It doesn't have to be. One way. Yeah, that's, for example, the vendor which does this like the whole way, uh, it has to be able to communicate with the server. It has a notion of commit. So until you commit your freshly installed uh, image, uh, Next time it reboots, it will go to the old one, so to say. Right. So, and you so can so add. How is it usually done? Like, what are the typical ways to determine that you're. Well, the most critical one, if you have a server component, I would say that you're able to talk to the server <laughs> after the update. In that case, you can always update again. But if you are not able to up talk to your server after the update, uh, it makes sense to revert back because something went wrong. Uh, if you only focus on Delta, what would be the advantages of the interface? Why not use Delta? Yeah, I'd like that. Um, well, Deltas are good, but there's no really good solution for it, in my opinion. So it's, there's probably going to be some, someone's going to fix this properly. Uh, but. Uh, Libre tree and stuff, it's really, it's really great, but it's not really, it doesn't cover all the corner cases. It's, the problem is it's brickable. So you, you can build around that, so you, have, you can build, uh, like if you combine maybe a recovery OS with libos tree and uh, like, uh, then you can probably like close all the gaps <coughs> that exist. Um, so yeah, Delta updates is great, yeah, basically, but not really solved in my opinion. But uh, these full image updates, it's, it's simplicity because you always you know what you flash, uh, and that's easy to if you have ten thousand devices, you know that they all are going to end up with the same software uh, because you do like flash everything every time, uh, and that's easy to verify if you if you have a device out in the field, uh, it has an issue, you just take that same image, flash your device that you have locally. And hopefully you can like, uh, and you're pretty sure that you're running the same software that you have in your in the field. Uh, you still get those on the download. Hmm? You still get a, a differential download. Don't yeah. necessarily need to download the entire image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Delta image-based update is the optimum, I would say, but it's not really there. So can you even roll back a Delta update? 
Yeah, you Libor, Libor S3 actually has support to roll back, but that means <laughs> it must be able to boot. To right. Yeah. So, what, what you need to... Are you talking about the download or the installation? Because during the download, even if you have two images, the download itself can, of course, be delta based. You can yeah, yeah, download what has, what has changed. Yeah. And reuse what is already on Yeah, and that's what I'm like. Especially uh, if you use something like CA Sync that works almost by magic. Yeah. You can yeah, so that's what. Do something similar. Yeah. And it will avoid to download those parts that you already yeah. have. So you, that, yeah, that's what I feel is like the next. All of these projects that do image based up updates, they are experimenting with Chaos Sync or other tools to do. To just download the deltas and apply yeah. them, even if they are. And then you really have a robust and super system. And otherwise, you could calculate on that, of course. If you know exactly what you're running in, in, in the take, mm -hmm. you could calculate the data to tell them. Yeah. So there it is. A little bit plus recovery. Hmm? Little bit plus recovery. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, you have to work really around. Yeah, so. That's one possibility. Yeah? So most of these methods are, are you seeing like a, a static bootloader? I mean, you know, yeah. it's in status. If you want to upload the, if you want to update the bootloader. You can still do it in most of these systems, but it's not something it's, that's recommended to do, because that's your single point. If this, that fails, you can't recover from that. So you, you can still do it. There's nothing stopping you, you know, like post-install script. You want a brickable system. Yeah, but if yeah, if you want a brickable system, you can. So none of these are like attempting to. Hmm. Uh, none of these are attempting to. That's not a problem. They're interested in something. No, it's not. It has to be like the boot ROM has to be able to boot from different locations, if you want to have like redundant bootloaders. So the 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 the, the chip you are running must be able to like probe to two locations for this to be possible, because. Right now, it's like, yeah, it's very fixed where the bootloader is, if it, and if you try to update that and you fail, there's no like, so it's really a problem on the hardware to solve, to make the update redundant. And maybe there are some chips that do that, I don't know. Just a comment, uh, uh, I'm using a, uh, I think it started off as a, that you boot to the call and Fairbox, I think. Yeah, Fairbox, yeah. And that has a built-in feature that's supposed to self-update by keeping the initial sectors or whatever on flash and doing this swap, it's swapping itself out, basically. Yeah. Same, I think that's the real uh, okay. cause. But I'm not sure how safe it is because it doesn't seem that that many people use it. Yeah, use yeah bootloader so could probably solve this by like being you more than a bootloader. You uh, give it a special command, yeah. like do self-upgrade with this file and mm -hmm. then it. And if it fails, it's supposed to revert to itself. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure how certain that is because it's... Uh, mm -hmm. There is support in Google as well for redundancy by using the as <coughs> as initial <coughs> smaller part of the facts. So yeah, that's there true. is a talk about Google so that's really good that explains this. So, yeah. Somewhere you have to have redundancy. Yeah. So yeah, bootloaders can solve this by being like yeah, primary bootloaders, a secondary stage, and third stage. Like so, you have two copies of the third stage bootloader. You can. <coughs> Any more questions? I like questions. Thank you. <laughs>